Good morning. Good morning. That's about all I got. <laughs> I had asked uh, several weeks ago, uh, I met with TJ, who had spent, what was it, five weeks? Seven. Seven weeks in India. Um, we got to have lunch together and he was sharing with me some of the things that uh, he had learned, some of the experiences that he had, and I felt really impressed that he needed to share some of this with Jesus Community Church. So, here's TJ. Thank you. You are welcome, sir. Yeah, he's wearing shoes. <laughs> it is always a privilege to come back here and fellowship with you guys and give you an update of my crazy life. Um, last summer when I was here, I talked to you guys and was unsure of the steps that God had for me in the future. I um, left YWAM St. Croix in December, so I'm no longer working directly with them. I still partner with them a little bit. Um, and it was just kind of a, an interesting season for me of just trying to rediscover who I was, um, who God was to me, who I was to God. And um, yeah, it was just kind of a difficult time of not really being sure of what I was doing or where I was going. And I just really felt like God was just saying, trust me, you know. Um, I'm not going to give you the entire plan. I just want you to take it step by step. And so that's what I did. And um, on Christmas Eve, I was at a, a friend's house for a Christmas Eve party. And his daughter had just graduated from college. And throughout the evening, like we had never met. And so that night was the first time I met her. And throughout the evening, she just kept asking me questions about who I was and what I was doing and all of these things. And so obviously, missionary came up and faith came up. And throughout the entire evening, she just kept kind of picking at me and questioning me. And finally, at about 11.30 at night, it's just her, me, and then my, her, I guess it would be like stepsister. Um, we were just all sitting in the kitchen. And everybody else had left. My friends had actually gone to bed. And so it's just the three of us sitting there. And she just finally looked at me and she said, I have some questions for you. And I don't want you to get upset. I don't mean to offend you. I don't, I don't want to argue with you. But I just have some questions for you. And if at all, at any point in our conversation, if you get offended or you get upset, please tell me and I'll stop asking. And I was like, okay. And so she just bombarded me with questions. And um, I have a, a little video that I put together which every question that is in this video are questions that I was asked unexpectedly in this conversation. And um, so let's just watch this video really quick. It's only like a a minute long, but hopefully it can questions that I was unexpectedly asked in a conversation and you know to be honest with you I had some answers and to some questions I would say I don't really see that as a, 
a main thing for me, you know, like I've never been tripped up about that as far as it concerning my salvation, so to be honest with you, I've never thought much about that question, and then to some, I was like, um, you know, I just, I have faith in God that this is what it is, and, and at some points, that answer doesn't sit well with people, you know, the, the answer of, I just have faith in God. If they don't believe in God, then your faith is worthless to them. And so I left that conversation, and I was just like, man, God, I feel like I did an okay job. I mean, it's 11.30 at Christmas Eve. I'm not expecting to really testify the gospel. But I think I did an okay job, but there's, there's more that I want to know. I want to know some of these hard questions, you know? Why, why are there things that when people look at our faith that they think that we're just picking pieces out of the Bible and living, and then there's other parts where it seems like we aren't living that? Is it a cultural thing of the past that we no longer need to celebrate, or is it something that we've just completely lost in, in translation, so to speak? And just all these different things, and so... I really just left there and I was like, I want to know more. I want to know what I believe for one, and I want to know why I believe it, and I want to be able to give answers. Because at the end of our conversation, she just looked at me and she said, thank you. I think you did a good job. Um, you know, you weren't expecting to have this conversation, so I think for it being sprung on you, I think you did a good job. But I think that there's areas in your faith that you need to study more so that you can give a better answer. And I said, I agree. I said, I fully agree with you that there are some questions in there that I never contemplated. I mean, she asked me one question. What do you think about the Eucharist? There's three different views that people have on the Eucharist. What view do you have? I was like... I don't even know that there's three views. And so she started explaining all these different three views, and I was like, I've never thought of that before, but this is what I think of it right now. You know, and so there are some answers that I just came up with right on the spot. And um, so yeah, it was just a very interesting conversation. And then the next day I go to a friend's house for Christmas and I run into a friend there who has done a lot of teachings and apologetics for our church. And apologetics um, is basically just, is a word derived from Greek, which literally means to give a defense. And um, it's about communicating the gospel so that it remo removes confusion surrounding it. And so I just walked in and I was like, oh my gosh, you would have loved this <laughs> conversation I had last night. So I just began telling her all about it telling her the questions, and she's just sitting on her iPad and just scrolling and, and doing stuff, and I find out later that she's just sending me emails the entire time that I'm talking to her to different apologetic sites, and, and one of the sites that she sent me to was the Robbie Zacharias website and this three-week course in apologetics in India, and she just simply wrote, this would be a great place for you to start. And I didn't even know that she's sending this until later that night when I got home. And I started reading through all of these websites and I got to this three week course and I was just like, wow, God, like this is exactly what I was asking for last night. You know, it, it covers different topics of, of our faith and gets to the ground roots. You know, this was a course of, on apologetics, which apologetics just takes a whole bunch of different areas. It takes logic, it takes history, it takes science, it takes um, archaeology, and all of these different areas to help us Christians defend our faith or to give answers. And, and so when I was reading through that, I was like, yeah, this is, this is something that I want to do. And I'm looking, I'm like, it's in India. <laughs> wow. I've always wanted to go to India. About a month before I actually saw this site, I was um, 
In St. Croix, this is what happens to our Bibles because of the humidity and everything, and if you use them a lot, the leather falls off. And so I had a Bible that I was recovering with just clips that I had taken out of magazines, and so I was gluing them on, and, and there was one clip that just had the continent of or the country of India with a bunch of faces in it. And so I put that like right on the front. And I just began praying for India. And I said, God, I want to go there someday. And it was just so cool because in a couple weeks, he was going to be leading me to a place where I had an opportunity to go to India, you know. And um, so just one thing after another just kept confirming that this was a right step that I needed to take. And, and it came at such a awesome time because I was in a spot where I didn't know what I was going to be doing. And if it had been any time in my span with YWAM, I wouldn't have been able to do it just because of my schedule there and my commitments to that ministry. And so it was just awesome timing to see how God had removed me from prior commitments to just allow me the freedom to go. And as any of you guys looked at the bulletin, it has 1 Peter 3.15 on it. And it says, be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. And so that's, that's what apologetics is all about. It's not, for me, it, it wasn't even more that I wanted to go to India and to take this course so that I could argue with people. Because, as you guys know, arguments get us nowhere in our faith. People come to us desiring us to argue, and then they can just write us off and be like, see, you're just like everybody else. You have no love, you have no compassion. All you want to do is force your faith upon us. And that's not what, what we are to do, you know. Apologetics is used for evangelism. That's what it bases itself out of. But it's really it's used for laying down concrete evidence of why you believe Jesus to be who he says. And that's what I went there for, because I wanted to know what I was believing. I wanted to know why I was believing it. It wasn't, it wasn't that I wanted to go and have all of these super high godly conversations with people, I, I wanted to know for myself. And then when I got there, and I realized that apologetics was all about evangelism, I was like, wow. Like, all, I mean, I was in a group of 25 people. I was the only foreigner. There was one, one other foreigner, you could say, but he was from Myanmar, and he had been living in India for the last four years. And so... Everybody else in the group, they were Indians, and so I was the only white person. And it was just an awesome time of learning that culture, because they were, it was taught in English, thank goodness, because I don't know any Hindi words or anything, but um, it was just really cool to, to go there and to just submerge myself in this culture and everything that was taught it was taught from the Indian perspective and so I was not only learning about apologetics and learning about my faith but I was learning it from some exterior person and culture and country that I had never experienced before and so it was just like incredibly chaotic at times and just trying to understand the mindset of this country and these people and um, yeah and so as you can imagine apologetics is such a huge huge <laughs> subject to cover and so even being there for three weeks it was I mean we just barely scratched the surface of it and today I hope that you guys are wide awake because I'm gonna scratch the surface of the surface that I scratched there <laughs> and just give you a little glimpse into what apologetics is and how you can use different tools in our faith and how it's important for us to have different tools because there's so many different religions and so many different perspectives of the world which we call a worldview that people have that 
if you don't have tools and if you don't have the ability to really try and figure out where they're coming from, to put yourself in their shoes and to think like they think, there's no way that you're going to be able to communicate the gospel to them in a proper way. And that's what we're all about, you know. The Great Commission tells us to go and preach to the world. And if we have this gospel in our lives and it's truly transforming our lives and it's truly the greatest thing that saves us from death and gives us eternal life and it's something that we need to share with each other, then we need to do that. You know, if, if everything that we believe is true and if we truly believe it, we have the greatest news for anybody, for the world. And I don't know about you, but oftentimes for me, even as a missionary, I've gotten stuck in myself and gotten stuck in saying, well, I know that I should go do that or I should be more excited about my faith and I should start conversations with people in the grocery store or where I work and do all of these things, but what if they make fun of me or what if they ask me a question that I don't know the answer to and come up with all these excuses like does that really matter like if this gospel has truly changed our lives we should be telling everybody about it and we should not care what they think because ultimately God is the one who we're trying to impress and to live correctly with and man can't do anything to us, you know, and so, um, so yeah, th this is just going to be a very, hopefully, not too confusing topic for you this morning, but, um, it's, yeah, it's just something that I, I really wanted to, um, to just give you a glimpse of, of what I was able to learn there. And I'm by no means perfected any of this. I received tools and information on guides on how to go further in this study of apologetics. But, I mean, there's people who've been apologists for years who are still discovering new ways to use apologetics and new techniques. Um, but one of there's three main areas that I would that I want to touch on today, and the first topic is philosophy. And philosophy is the exercise of reason and search for truth. And so, if you break down the word philosophy, you have philo, which is to love, and sophia is wisdom. And so, philosophy just means the love of wisdom. And everybody has what philosophy philosophers refer to as a worldview, or a way of making sense out of the universe and the data around us. And it's an explanation of reality, whether they have formally analyzed it or not, we all have a worldview, and it's shaped by our families, by the places that we are raised, the things that we read and watch, everything around us influences our worldview. And whether you have formally accepted something, subconsciously you have formed different perspectives on different things. Whether it is, you know, your view on Christianity, if it's really true. You have a worldview on that belief system. And so, um, yeah. And philosophy is the effort to engage in rational and consistent inquiry concerning the truth claims of any belief system. So people use philosophy to understand the beliefs a person has. And there's four main branches of philosophy. You have logic, which is laws of thought and argumentation. It's basically, how do I think? You know, logically, what, what does my mind go to when I think of this? Um, you have epistemology. These are all really big words that all have different meanings that I really didn't want to go into bore you guys with today. Um, hopefully, 
in the future maybe there will be some sort of better teaching that I can come to you with and a longer time frame than an hour to to go into this. Um, that's something that God is kind of laying on my heart is to take this to churches and to present it in like a weekend seminar possibly and, and take it to the um, discipleship training school in YWAM and make a whole week teaching out of apologetics and worldview and evangelism um, because those are all well, worldview and evangelism are each week topics, and so, um, yeah, it's just been something that God is laying on my heart. But you have epistemology, which is the theory of knowledge. How do I know? Metaphysics is the nature of reality. And so then you want to ask the question, what is the nature of reality? The things around me, what is the nature of them? And then axiology is the study of values and ethics. Or how do I choose? What do I know? How do I know that this is right and this is wrong? Or that that's the right thing to do and this is the wrong thing? Um, and so, suppose for a minute that you're, you're talking to an atheist and they confront you, kind of like the video that we saw. And they confront you with this argument. An all-good God would defeat evil. An all-powerful God could defeat evil, but evil is not yet defeated, so therefore, God must not exist. How do you respond to that? You know, if, if somebody has made these claims that this is, this is the God that you're saying that you believe in, that He is an all-good God, He's an all-powerful God, so He should remove evil from the world if he is truly good and if he's all-powerful he can remove evil from the world and so since evil isn't defeated your good and all-powerful God can't exist you know and so you sit there and you're just like um I don't know you know and so how do we refute this argument and how do we lead a person from this specific worldview to more of a truth worldview, of a theistic worldview. You know, and, and theism is the belief that God exists or that many God exists. We as Christians have a monotheistic worldview, which we believe in one God and one God only. And so this is where we can use some of the tools in apologetics and, and think of this conversation or this argument in a logical way. And so as I previously stated, logic is the branch of philosophy responsible for establishing the laws of argumentation. And so we want to go back to it and say, how do I think? Okay, that's what logic is all about. It's about thinking. And logic governs the world of reason by distinguishing between acceptable and unacceptable forms of argumentation. And so philosophy analyzes the support of a particular bit of evidence that brings to bear on a specific belief. And again, I know that there's going to be tons of words thrown at you that could be confusing and... I apologize for that, but it, it really is um, very interesting to see how if you begin to break down conversations and break down even arguments or statements, how, how you can see how they are formulated and, and see the trap that people are trying to get us into in our faith. And so if you look at the conclusion of this argument that we had in our example, therefore no such God exists, um, you will see that not all of the information in the conclusion has been mentioned in the previous statements. And so we call those previous statements premises. It's just a fancy word for information given. Um, but you can see that there's additional information in the conclusion that was not even discussed about in the premises. Um, 
And so there's, there's two different types of arguments. You have a deductive argument, which basically reasons from general to particular. So you have a wide range of things that you're going from down to something particular. And that's a deductive statement or argument. And then you have an inductive argument, which starts with a particular and it reasons to the general. And so one major difference between the two is that in the conclusion, in a deductive argument, it contains information already mentioned in the premises. And so here would be an example of a deductive argument. So say you have a bookshelf right here. And so all of the books on this shelf are science books. Okay? If I go over there and I take a book from the bookshelf and I look at it and I say this book is from that shelf. Theoretically this should be a science book, right? Because I've already stated that all of the books on the shelf are science books. So I can confirm to you and I can say this book is from that shelf. This book is a science book. So we're going from the shelf, so the general shelf, and we're taking it down to one book, a particular book. So we're going from general to particular. And so you can see that the premises are true, and the conclusion has all of the information already stated through simple logic and through testing. You can have your conclusion. Now if we go to an inductive argument, we're going to, remember, we're going to go from particular to general. And so, I can take a book and I can say, this book is from that shelf. This book is a science book. All of the books on that shelf are science books. Do you see where that is kind of different? You know, because you're just randomly taking a book, you haven't stated that all of these books are science books. So there could be all different types of books, and no matter how many books you take, you still can't conclude um, concretely that this, all of these books are going to be science books. And so, even if the premises are true, you cannot certainly conclude that all of the books on the shelf are science books just from two pieces of information. It is possible that the conclusion is correct, but you wouldn't know until you examined every single book. And so you would continuously have to keep pulling. And, and so that's where you have that the conclusion in an inductive argument is probable, but not factual. Whereas in a deductive, you have the facts and the conclusion follows as true. So going back to our first argument with the, the atheist and our all-good and all-powerful God, we can conclude that the argument can be categorized as an inductive argument because we've already stated that all of the information in the conclusion was not presented in the premises. And so it means that for our friend to claim that the conclusion in their argument necessarily follows from the premises, that's incorrect. They, they cannot state that there's factual evidence in the argument to support their conclusion. That just because that there's evil, and just because that our God is good and all-powerful, it doesn't mean that He doesn't exist because evil still exists. So can you see how, once you begin to look into these arguments or these statements, how logically, if you begin to break them down, how, how there's little ground in some of them. You know, that, and so that's just one example of, of using different tools for, for our benefit. You know? And so you could, you could go to them and you can say, well, just because you say that, it doesn't mean that there's no existence of God. There's so many more things that, that you can discuss, and you can't take 
one little thing and broaden it across the board and say, just because that one thing exists, God can, you know? And so that's the logic side of, of apologetics that, I mean, we spent the entire first week looking at different statements and going through trying to find faulty wording and different things. And I mean, it was the first week that I was there, I was just like, oh my gosh, what did I get myself into? Because this is, this is way above my head, you know? And if any of you guys are familiar with the Indian culture, education is very, very highly regarded there. And so I'm sitting in a room full of Indians and they're just like, digging through it, and I'm just like, holy cow, I feel like my simple education is not too good right now. But it did get easier, and the more that we began to look into it and break down logically and all of these things, um, it became fun, because you would be able to read a, a sentence, and even throughout the entire course, we would be sitting around the table and somebody would say something and we'd be like, that's a fallacy, you can't say that. Because you can't just broaden the spectrum and say, everybody does this. And, or, I've said it a million times. Really, did you really say it a million times? Like, think about what you're saying. You know, and so it, it became a game for us and um, we began to think through everything that was said, which is, obviously important and so yeah there are so many more um, complicated terms and and things that we studied but it was interesting to look at it from a different perspective and begin to dissect things that are said or things that are written down and like I said earlier that if we are going to be presenting the gospel we need to understand the society that we are going to be witnessing to. And so we, we have to understand different worldviews that people have. Because we've already stated that we all have a worldview. And so that was kind of the next main section that, that we took a lot of time to study. You know, because as, as believers, we need to know what other people believe so that we can come back to them with the truth of the gospel. And unfortunately, there's a lot of religions out there that know our faith better than we do. And they can come to us and say, well, why, why do you have this? And why do you do that? And, you know, in our religion, we do this and we do that, and that's way better than yours. And, and I've been in those situations before of trying to minister to somebody, and they come at me with all of these things, and I'm just like, I, I don't know. Well, it's your faith, you should know. Well, I, I, I have faith, you know? <laughs> God. Um, and so, when we look at a worldview, there are main elements of a worldview that kind of bring a worldview its structure. And so, one of the main things in a worldview is a belief about God. Does God exist? That is one question that somebody with the worldview would ask. Or, what is he, she, or they like? You know, and so they have some particular view of God. And then they have a belief about the world. What is the nature of external reality? That is basically the world around us. What is the nature of it? And what is the beginning of it? Why is it here? And all of those questions that could follow that. Um, you have a belief about human beings. What is a human being? That's a question that could be asked. What happens to a person after death? Everybody has some sort of view on what humans are and what happens to humans. They have a belief about knowledge. Why is it possible for us to know anything at all? Um, a belief about morality. How do we know what is right and what is wrong? A belief of what is wrong with us. Why is there suffering? Everybody has some sort of view on, on why they're suffering in the world. And then, a, a remedy for our existential condition. 
How can we alleviate suffering in the world, and how can we make a world a better place? You know, whether we have specifically asked these questions to ourselves and sat down and come up with an answer, we all have some sort of an answer for this, you know? How to make the world a better place. Jesus! That's the, you know? <laughs> Jesus is always the answer. But, um, three ways to evaluate a worldview. Things that we can ask in, in that is, does this worldview make sense? Logically and consistently, it's kind of the test of reason. Like, does it make sense the way that I am thinking about this? Does it correspond to reality? It's the test of experience. Is it relevant to what we know about the world and ourselves? And then lastly, is it livable? And this is kind of the test of practice. Can the person who professes this worldview and this belief system live consistently in harmony with the system that they are professing? And so it's, it's all about experience and, and just living it out. Um, some common worldviews that we have, of course, you have monotheism, which is the belief of one God. You have pantheism, which believes that the universe is identical to divinity, and so that basically says anything and everything is a god. And there's people that believe this. Um, you have polytheism, which is what Hinduism is based out of, um, the belief of multiple gods. You know, and it's not just one specific god, but it's multiple gods that that they pray to. And that's kind of where the Roman gods and the Greek gods all come from as well. Like they all have like the god of the sun, the god of the sea, the god of love, all of these things. Um, you have atheism, the absence of belief that any deity exists. All of the religions of the world, they have their own worldview. And um, so there's just tons of different worldviews that are around us that you know, some of us might not even know any of the worldview perspectives that people have, but it's important for us when we meet people to understand a different, different way of thought. And, and through conversation with somebody, we can sometimes, if we're familiar with different worldviews, we can, we can understand where they're coming from, and then we can place ourselves into that worldview and bring the gospel to formulate to that conversation. Um, and so then, yeah, excuse me. So worldview was, again, another huge topic that we covered. It's kind of the basis of apologetics is just understanding the different worldviews. And then one of my last um, favorite sections was the Bible and science, and I've had a couple people actually email me, some of the people that I train with in St. Croix, um, I was sending them the exact same emails that I was sending the church, and I had one of my friends email me back and he says, I'm so excited for you to come back, and I'm really interested in hearing about the Bible and science, because I don't understand how they can tie into each other. And um, so it was really cool to, to get that email and to, you know, even in the time of me preparing to go to India and looking over the curriculum of the class and telling people about apologetics and how you use science and history and logic and all of these different things. Like, science was always the one that would stick out to people in conversation. They're just like, how does that work? You know, and um, it was the Christian worldview that provided the intellectual breeding ground for modern science to flourish. Copernicus, Pascal, Kepler, and Newton were all devout Christians who allowed their faith and their profession to collide with each other. And so for most of them, faith was a product of their scientific studies and their motivation for further study was their faith. And so they, they 
made the two come together and the faith fueled their studies and their studies fueled their faith. And I remember when I was in college and I took an anatomy class. And if none of you guys have ever taken an anatomy class, like, just go online and start Googling anatomy because it was in that class where I was listening to my teacher talk about the human body and the amazing details of it and all of these things. And then in the same breath, he says, and then you have some people that believe that this was all created by a god and all of this stuff. I'm not going to get into that. But I'm sitting right there and I'm just like, you are one of the smartest people that I have ever met. And in this particular area, you are one of the most ignorant people. Because I'm looking at the human body and I'm seeing all of the amazing details of everything, and my faith is just being, like, exploding inside of me, like, oh my gosh, God, you are even more apparent to me now, because there's absolutely no way that this body functioning can come from one tiny little bacteria and, and grow into this, you know, and so it was my faith in that class, it was just like, wow, this is awesome, but... So then, yeah, it's just incredible, and, and so it just blew my mind away that some of the smartest people in the world have just something in their mind that is telling them that this is not a God-given thing, you know, and um, so yeah, it's, for me it was just like what it was for these early scientists, that it, it fueled my study of faith. And um, so when we look at the Bible and science, you can say that the Bible is pre-scientific in time and non-scientific in purpose. The Bible was not written to be a textbook of science, but the Bible can come along science and prove science, and science can prove the Bible. Um, science is concerned with the function and mechanism. Mechanism is just the natural or established process by which something takes place. And so that's what science is concerned about. It's concerned about function and the natural process by which something takes place. And scripture is engaging itself with purpose and meaning. Science seeks to seeks cause and effect relationships in the universe primarily through observation and experiments. The domain of science is strictly a space, time, and matter domain. And science can only give us mechanisms that explain natural processes, but it cannot comment on the meaning of it. And so, we can go back to science, and science says that the universe originated from the Big Bang. And so they have formulated their hypothesis and everything about how the Big Bang has created everything. But science cannot tell us why it originated in the first place. They say it happened, but they cannot figure out how it happened or why it happened. And so the big being behind the Big Bang cannot be created in their experiments. They, there's absolutely no way that they can bring together their hydrogen and all of their elements and create this Big Bang over again. Um, and C.S. Lewis put it so well that the laws of motion did not set the billiard balls moving they analyze the motion after something else has provided it. So that's basically what science is doing. It is giving the explanation after the effect of what has happened. And so God has, so to speak, um, written two different books for humans to, um, to read. He has disclosed himself in two distinct ways through his created world, which is nature, and his revealed word, which is scripture. 
Science is a human interpretation of the nature, and likewise, theology is the human interpretation of Scripture. So both of them are human interpretations of both things that God has given us. And so since God is the author of both Scripture and nature, these, so to speak, books, they can never contradict each other. What can is the interpretation of science and theology. That's where we're going to find different beliefs and contradictions of each other. But nature, which is authored by God, and scripture, which is authored by God, will never contradict each other. It's only in our understanding of the two. And in Genesis 1.1, it's the majestic opening verse of the Bible, and it's a powerful declaration that has equal implications on theology and science. There's a man named Herbert Spencer, an avowed evolutionist. He wrote a book called First Principles. And in that book, he outlines five categories that are ultimate scientific ideas. You have time, you have force, action, space, and matter. And Spencer believed that all of these categories, that these five categories encompass all that truly exists in our universe. And that means no real existence is possible outside of these five categories. And although it is true that Spencer's categories have no room for anything spiritual, it's striking that the declaration in Genesis 1-1 accounts for all five categories of what Spencer suggested. And so, if you look at Genesis 1-1, it says, In the beginning, that's time. God, that's the force, created, that's action, the heavens, that's the space, and the earth, that's the matter. And so, as you can see, the Bible and science are coming together in this one first verse, and there's many other verses in the Bible that can be drawn to that, but, I mean, it's just so cool when you begin to look at the Bible from a different way and bring external things to help understand, you know, like Spencer says, there's absolutely nothing outside of these five things that can exist, and Right there in the very beginning of our scripture, God is using science to explain his creation. And so it was an infinite personal God who created the finite space, time, and mass continuum, which is what science works through only. And so um, the, this verse provides the basis for causality, for the cause for everything that is finite, which science is unable to explain. And so, this is where you can say that the Big Bang came from. And this is the one portion that science is lacking, you know. And, and so, yeah, it was just a, a crazy course, you know. After we studied into all of these, we went into specific studies of specific worldviews, and we were able to take time and, and actually study into some of these worldviews, and we had to try and present the gospel to a, a group of these people, you know, and so we had a couple different groups. There was an Islamic group, and so basically what we had to do is we had to pretend that we were Christians, which obviously wasn't that hard, but we had to study Islam. And we had to study what they believed, how they believed, all of these different things. And we had to bring the truth of the gospel to them through coming up with their areas that, that they're faulting in, in their belief system. And so we had 40 minutes for this presentation. And we had the first 20 is when we would basically just bring up different belief systems of them. And, um, and just bring the gospel alongside of it. 
And then the last 20 minutes, it was kind of open forum questions. And so it was like we were speaking to a group of Islams. Is, um, and so some of the questions that came out of those times were just like what that video was saying, you know? And, and so it was just a group of Muslims that they had studied the Christian word and they know their faith. And so they're just throwing arguments out. And it was amazing to see some of the questions that came out of that time, you know? And I was not in the Islamic group, but I mean, I remember sitting there through some of the groups, and I'm just like, I'm so glad I'm not part of that group, because I don't know that answer. But it was, it was really cool, because we were able to um, be in a safe environment, you know, and be able to explore more of our faith, and be put on the spot with some of these very difficult questions. And, and it was like real life, you know, it, it was these... Questions of faith that were tripping us up, you know, and and every, you know, we had one person who, just every group that went up, he just had like nailing questions for each of them, and it was just funny because he's like, you know, we would address him and be like, well, you believe? He's like, well, no, wait, hold on, I don't believe this. He says, I'm just here with a friend. He invited me to this church today, and so like, I mean, he was just totally playing up the part, but I mean, he would just come up with amazing questions that we were just like, wow, this is really good, and, and this is things that we need to know, you know, and um, so yeah, that was kind of my, my experience in that course, you know, it was a three-week course, just, like I said, barely touched the surface of what apologetics is, but it helped me understand more of what I believed. It gave me concrete information and facts and new ways to look at my faith. And um, last summer when I was up here on my sabbatical, it, it really was just a, a time of rediscovering who God was, you know, like I had said earlier. And, and this course really did, it, it opened up my eyes to a whole new world of, of not just having opportunity to defend my faith or to get into these conversations, but it was really just, for me, personally, just understanding more of what I believed and, and kind of taking my relationship with the Lord to the next level, you know, and that's something that God has really been speaking to me over this last year is if I'm going to be professing to be a, a Christ follower or a Christian, I need to be walking the walk and I need to be talking the talk, you know. And it's not just simply sitting back and doing nothing. I need to, I need to live it, you know. And of course I struggle every day with living out my faith, but being intentional in conversations with people that you meet, whether it's the people that you work alongside with, whether you are with your family or your friends, or just meeting a random person in the grocery store or the gas station, you know, it's being intentional and just being Jesus in those moments to those people and, and really just living out the faith that we are claiming to have, you know, we are... We are the only Bible that some people are ever going to see. And so if we aren't living the way that Jesus has taught us to live, and we aren't going and, and making an impact in the world around us, you know, we're missing opportunities. We're missing opportunities to share the gospel with people. And one of the greatest compliments that I received in the course, I had the opportunity to speak at our graduation ceremony there. Um, I think that they just wanted an outsider's perspective of the, the course, but after I had spoken and kind of told my purpose in coming to India and having it be more 
of a personal thing for my faith, the woman that was leading it, she just got up and, and she just thanked me. She said, thank you for coming. Um, I find it very interesting that you, an American, have come all the way from India, or all the way from America to India to learn more about God. She says, that is a very rare thing because most people from the Western world will come to India for their religion, for the Hinduism religion, and to understand more of that religion. And so she was very excited. She says, you know, I'm, I'm very impressed and I love the fact that you have come to one of the biggest countries of of Hinduism where they have multiple gods but you have come in search of the one true God and so that just melted my heart when she spoke that to me because that's truly why I went there you know and in preparation for going to India everybody's like well why are you going to India why are you doing that and, um, I looked for this course elsewhere and um, the ministry Ravi Zacharias Ministries has smaller courses of like one week, one topic courses for this apologetics, but it nothing encompassed all of what this course did anywhere except for in India. And so I just, I went to India because of that. And even after being there, um, talking with the school leaders and, and other people, you know, it's such a necessary thing, not only specifically in India, but around the world, you know. And this is such a, such a rich, um, such rich content that all believers need to know, you know. We need to be able to come at our faith through different ways in, in conversations with people and even presenting the gospel in different ways because there's some people that only think intellectually and that's like I said earlier that's where the faith-based answers aren't going to work they need proof they need logic and they need science and they need historical facts to believe what they believe and and so we need to be able to provide those answers for them and and like I said, you know, I'm hoping that over this next year, um, kind of what I've been feeling the Lord is leading me to, I am going back to St. Croix, um, and I think I'm going to be continuing my, my studies in this area, um, like I said, trying to prepare a discipleship training school teaching, but also hopefully coming up with some sort of thing that I can offer to churches. You know, I have my church down there, I have this church, I have friends in other churches that are all saying, do it, come, whenever you get it ready, come to us and and we'll let you present it, you know, and so if you guys definitely would be praying with me on that, it's just that, that God would open this up, you know, that if this is truly something that he wants me to pursue, that I would be able to have the clarity of mind to formulate an easy, teachable teaching of this to where I could come in for a weekend seminar or something to to just give basic apologetic tools to help people further their studies in this. Um, and also, um, my training ministry has been amazing. Um, I went back to St. Croix last year and and I kept asking myself, you know, am I only going back there because I want to? Is it just because of me, or does God have a plan and a purpose? And, and in January, I was really struggling because I was kind of at, asking myself, and I was saying, you know, I don't really feel like I am doing much in this ministry with the athletes on the island. Of course, I'm training with them daily sometimes, but... I never really felt like I was gaining ground, you know. It, it's been four years since I started running and, and training with some of these people since day one. 
and I just kind of felt like I was in the same spot with some of them. And then in January, when I was going through this questioning time, I began to meet different people from different groups of my friends, and um, you know, they would just call me up one day and they'd be like, hey, let's go for a bike ride. So I had the freedom to drop what I was doing and go for a bike ride. And they began initiating conversations towards God. And they began asking questions about why I do what I do or how I got started. And, and as you all know, like my testimony of running stems right out of my faith. And so I was just able to go into great detail and talk to them. And, and my pastor down there is very encouraging as well. And, and he's just like, well, I'm not surprised that they're asking you about it. Because he says, you were this no-named nobody who just showed up one day barefoot running with these people. And now you went from running a 5K to a marathon to a 50-mile race to short triathlons to half Ironman iron to half Ironman triathlons. And, and you just keep going, you know, and, and you're doing well in it. And so these athletes that have been training for years and still don't have the guts to do some of the things that you're doing, of course they're going to be asking questions, you know? And so it was just really cool in that time to see how the seeds have been planted and that God is finally allowing stuff to grow and, and there's a time of reaping what I've sown is coming, you know? And so, um, yeah, I'm just going back and looking forward to the conversations that I know are already waiting for me because I spent seven weeks in India taking this course and all of my friends knew that I was going there and what I was doing. And so like as soon as I go back, you know, I know that my first run or my first bike ride, people are going to be drilling me with questions and it's just a time of testimony. You know, I've had a couple of people email me and say, I can't wait to sit down and, and have a meal with you and talk about your adventures and talk about what you've learned. And I'm just like, thank you, Lord, for such a, a right harvest, you know. So, yeah, just be praying with me in that. Um, again, I don't really know what this next year is holding. Um, I'm just kind of walking step by step by faith, um, trusting that like wherever God tells me to put my foot, that there's going to be something that it's going to hit down below because I, I kind of feel like I'm walking in the dark a little bit. But I know that at least for the next year, I'm going to be in St. Croix. I have multiple invitations from my friends in the course in India to come back to India and do ministry with them. So I'm looking at possibly next fall, creating some type of two to three month missions trip to India to visit about probably four or five different locations there and work with my friends. So um, yeah, it's gonna be another interesting year for sure. Um, but I know that God is taking care of me and I know that he's leading me in this and he's just, um, yeah, he's just made it a, an interesting journey for sure. I mean, I I would have never guessed that when I signed up to be a Christian that this was the life that he was going to take me on. You know, I, I've been to 12 different countries. I've preached the gospel in every one of them. Um, I've gone all over the United States. And it's just, it's just been really cool to, to see the journey that he's taken me on. And... And every, every place that I've gone, you know, I've met key people that either encourage me in my faith or give me opportunities to encourage others in their faith. And it's just the relationships that have come out of it have just been so rewarding and so beneficial. And um, yeah, and so I just, again, I appreciate the opportunity to come here, speak to you guys. I love the fact that Glenn isn't afraid to let me sit up here and teach you this stuff. Um, he had no idea what I was bringing, but he said that he was excited for whatever I was going to say. Um, and that's, that's truly an honor because I have 
talked with some people that when they go back to their home churches, they don't have the entire service to speak. And that's something that, that I truly value about this church. I know that Glenn has allowed me to have the whole service before. Kelly allowed me to have the whole service before. And, and it's just awesome. You know, I, I truly am blessed by that. And I don't take it lightly because I think that it's, it's a great privilege to be able to just share with you guys about what God's doing in my life and hopefully um, maybe some of the questions that were raised in that video today or some of the topics that I've talked about, hopefully it, it encourages you in your faith and it, it gets you thinking of how to be more intentional or how to go about answering some of these questions. You know, Maybe you have some of the answers to those questions or maybe you've never heard of those questions and you're like, yeah, I should probably know the answer. You know. Um, that's just my prayer that that you would be able to leave here today taking something with you and hoping that it it flourishes in your your heart and and drives you closer to to God. So again, thank you very much for your time. So, does anyone know what the three views of the Eucharist are? <laughs> I do. Would you like to know? Yes. Transubstantiation, consubstantiation, and representation. One of my teachers in college, I don't remember the teacher, but he's going to be so proud of me. Actually, I do remember the teacher, Dr. Guy Ames. Um, thank you, TJ. Um, we are the first experimental group for the new Bandai Ministries, Apologetic Ministries. And one of these days, when you see the crusade coming through the Northwest, you can tell people, hey, you need to go to that, because we were in the first one. Okay? The apologetics for the common man. That's, that's what we need. Because, you know, I, I follow Ravi Zacharias, I've read Lee Strobel, C.S. Lewis, and I read them, and then I reread them, and then I get a dictionary and I read them again, and then I talk with people that have read them, and then I go back and read them again because I still didn't get it. Um, but I do know this, uh, 1 Peter 3.15 tells us that we need to be prepared to give an answer for the hope that is in us. We have to be ready. 1 Timothy 2.15 tells us that we should study to show ourselves approved. Be prepared to show ourselves approved. Okay? Be ready. And when you think about that, we are studying an infinite God. If you ever get to the point where you feel like you've got it, you're lost. You're right back at the starting point. Because he's infinite. We'll never know everything that there is to know. And, you know, we, we oftentimes when we go, do your best to present yourself as one approved of God, we go, okay, well, we just need to know this. You, you realize this isn't everything, right? This is all we need to know, but this is the starting ground. It's just like TJ said, and, and, and we read in God's Word, God has presented himself through nature itself. Nature, everything that we find out in nature should always bring us right back to Scripture, and just like TJ was doing, just interlock everything. And, and it's not a, enough to go... Well, I just believe it. That's enough for your salvation, right? Belief is required unto salvation. Faith. That's enough for your salvation. But we're not called to just our salvation. That's the starting blocks. We're called to go out and witness and to testify about that salvation. And what do you do with somebody that goes, well, good, you believe, but I don't. Convince me. What do you go with someone who doesn't understand faith? All they understand is intellect. We all know people like that. I, I have a brother-in-law that's like that. Man, his brain, he, he's got to like partition it. He's only allowed to bring a part of it with him every day because it's so big. He's just very, very intelligent. And he's incredibly, incredibly ignorant. Hmm. Show me, show me, show me. You don't think God wants to show you don't think God wants to show them? Really? If God doesn't want to show them, why did Jesus do all the miracles that he did? His, 
his blood was sufficient on the cross. He could have come, lived a regular Joe life, and gone to the cross and still paid the price. But he didn't do that. He taught them. He showed them. He did miracles. He did wonders. God is willing to meet us where we are. And I tell you what, man, we need to get off the lazy boy. And we need to get our brains engaged in our faith. Because I, I'll confess, I grew up in a church where all it was was faith. And I prayed for years, God, take away IQ points and give me faith points. Do you realize that it was an incredibly intelligent man that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament? That without an intelligent man, we wouldn't have the book of Romans? A man of intellect wrote Romans. Yes, he was a man of faith too, absolutely. But you don't have to sacrifice intellect to embrace faith. Don't fall for that lie. Don't fall for that lie. God is calling us. He has given us gray matter up here. And a couple of things vibrating around in there to make it work. Don't forsake intellect, okay? 